All right, I got here. One sec. Okay. Uh, we are live, and welcome to the regular Sunday Lovecraft Easing uh, talk show. We do this every Sunday at 6 o'clock Eastern. Um, today is November the 23rd, 2014, and Rick's going to be more of a host today than I am, at least for the first part, uh, because he invited uh, Frank here. I, I still don't know how to pronounce his last name, Rick, I'm sorry. Um, why, don't, why don't you pronounce it, Frank? So we... Yeah, there you go. Could you pronounce your last name, Frank? Sheldon Dinner. Thank you, Frank. I think Frank might have a little bit of a delay, hey, hey. but maybe it'll fix itself. Um, so it's Frank Sheldon there. Anyway, uh, Rick and Frank uh, write a lot of pulp fiction. Rick writes some mythos fiction. Um, and I guess I'll let Rick take it from here. Okay. So. Frank is reflective of what's called New Pulp. And basically, New Pulp started around the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, it featured a lot of writers who grew up reading pulp magazine stories, including Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, all reprinted from Weird Tales. We also read all the hero pulps that were originally reprinted in paperbacks started in the 60s, like Doc Savage, The Shadow, The Spider, and so forth. And what um, eventually happened, new publishers came up, and they decided to do one of two things. Either continue the adventures of existing pulp heroes, now, those are either licensed in the case of somebody like Doc Savage, or the character is public domain if, it's, if the character is obscure enough. And the, besides reprinting new characters, they also allowed writers like me and Frank to create new characters in the tradition of the original pulp heroes. Now, one of Frank's, one of the characters Frank uses is a person called Thunder Jim Wade, who was created by Henry Cutner, original member of the Lovecraft Circle. Hmm. Now, Frank, could you give us a little uh, background on Thunder Jim Wade? A Thunder Jim Wade is a Lovecraft not uh, is not anything to do with Lovecraft. Sorry, uh, I have an issue here. Um, no, you're good. He's a Doc Savage knockoff. He's a Doc Savage knockoff, basically. That um, I'm sorry, I keep getting knocked in and out of here. Um, no, we he we can hear you fine. Created, we can hear you. We can hear you fine. Just okay. keep going. You hear me now? Yeah. We can hear you fine. Don't worry if you pitch it doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, sorry guys, I'm not used to this. Um. As I said, he was created as a knockoff of Doc Savage. He was a uh, mysterious character who was raised in Africa by a lost tribe of uh, colonists from Minos, the ancient uh, empire. And they had this great buildup of this character as a, an amazing fighter, a genius. Um, he created a incredible device called the Thunderbug, which is a combination tank, plane, submarine. It's always broken in all the stories. And uh, he was supposed to be along those lines. The problem is, is that he was never written in a very heroic sense. Where Doc Savage would have trouble fighting a polar bear with his bare hands, Thunder Jim Wade would struggle against a hyena. Uh, he, his adventures were just very lesser in tone to Doc Savage, and I just think it's basically because Cutner really didn't have much interest in the hero fiction in his style. It never was his thing. That's really the basic of uh, Thunder Jim. Now, this lost civilization that trained him, which was connected to uh, 
Crete, the Greek island of Crete, and many uh, historians believe it was actually the basis for the Atlantis legend. You decided to work that into the mythos, starting with an, a story in an anthology called The New Adventures of Thunder Dim Wave, Volume 1. You wrote a story called Depths of Horror. Could you talk about that a little bit? When I think of Thunder Jim Wade, I tried to, you know, I realized the limitations, so I decided to go the opposite direction with him. I decided to say, okay, you know, forget the limitations. Instead of trying to make him like Doc Savage, make him more of a character that would have dealt with the Lovecraftian issues. Uh, unique stuff like that. Instead of trying to copy what has been done so well by other writers, I decided to go and make him... Uh, a character whose basic really was to fight uh, the evils of the ancient past. Um, in this case, he met up with an ancient evil beneath the sea and very Lovecraftian, Innsmouth kind of storyline was created uh, as well as some other stuff uh, I threw in there. It was a fun story to write because I got a chance to play around with uh, the mythos. Um, as well as have a little bit of heroic fiction thrown in there as well. It, it looks like, too, uh, um, Matt put up a link on our message board to something called First Seas and Other Tales. Yeah. Um, a sea captain fights an ancient evil, a rockabilly a musician battles a scorpion the size of a Cadillac, a gangster takes on the spawn of Cthulhu. Um... Can you talk about that uh, book a little bit? And before I forget, guys, everybody watching, I'm giving away a print copy of uh, Lovecraft Easing to a random viewer. So I forgot to mention that earlier. Sorry. Go, go ahead, Frank. Um, first season, Other Tales, is really... Um, I decided to play around with uh, heroic, fiction, heroic pulp fiction. So I decided to write in different areas and different eras when we think of heroic fiction and pulp, we think of Doc Savage, the Shadow, the Spider, the Avenger, you know, I could go on for two weeks naming names, and they're all the basic of uh, comic characters to this day. But pulp fiction was a much bigger concept. Uh, Robert E. Howard wrote a great deal of pulp fiction, as did Kuttner and all these amazing writers, and I decided to see what I could do with different areas. So. I created a rockabilly musician who uh, is like uh, Silver John, really, for the 50s, 60s era, but in my own way, and dealt with more of a sci-fi kind of horror, you know, the basis of movies like Them, things like that. The first C's character, it's Captain C's, well, there was a villain in the Doc Savage movie named Captain C's who was just badly used, and I liked the name. And one day I, I was bet that I couldn't write a short fiction story uh, using that name in one day. And I did. So it came out pretty <laughs> fun. Uh, don't, don't tell a writer like that. We have to beat that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> That's the cover um, story. Uh, let me put you on the screen. Go ahead. Do that again, Rick. That's the, the Captain C story is the one with this. Oh, that's a great cover. Yeah, I, I actually, um, Tommy Hancock, the publisher, said, choose a visual from any of your stories, and that was the one I came up with, and the artist just did a beautiful job on it. Really proud of that. Yeah. Um, the Lovecraftian story in, in most of that was uh, a story that's really more gangster fiction than Lovecraft. Um, it involves a former bootlegger-type gangster who... Uh, it's very. It's hinted at that he's something happened to him, and that he's given up the whole gangster lifestyle to fight these evil creatures from beyond. And um, it, it's called uh, Saint Valentine's Spawn, and so it sort of involves something I grew uh, grew up loving, which was old-fashioned gangster stories like The Untouchables. And I involved a lot of real-life Chicago gangsters in that story as well. So I had a lot of fun writing that. So it was really more of a pulp experiment than anything else, but at least I got a chance to play with my favorite my areas. So Mind if I ask another quick question, Rick? Um, 
Do, does that, do any of those stories, I actually haven't read any of them yet, I'm going to have to do that. Uh, do any of them venture into noir at all, or do they stay more pulp? Which, I mean, that's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, but I was just curious. I think we lost him again. You there, Frank? I'm here. Um, the uh, the same, oh, there he is. We're back. Um, St. Valentine's Day Spawn is very noir, very, uh, um, oh, uh, very, um, Lovecraft meets the Untouchables. That's the best way I can call it. Uh, it was a lot of fun to write and a very unique world to play in. Uh, I never tried jamming something like that together, but, you know, people are doing that these days and I'm happy to read it. Yeah. No, a, a lot of the stories in the anthology, I, I think there were only two that were overtly Cthulhu mythos. Correct. But a lot of them are Lovecraftian in that first seas, for example. I mean, we, we never heard the name Deep One or uh, Cthulhu Spawn or anything else, Shagak or whatever. But the creatures, you know, could easily have been related to those uh, monsters. So a, a lot of this is Lovecraftian, right, Frank? Correct. I, most of my horror fiction has at least some touch on what Lovecraft started. Um, sometimes it's a little more Howard Love, uh, Howard version of Lovecraft. Sometimes it's more like the master himself. Um, sometimes it's just plain crazy what I come up with. Um, I wrote a story called uh, in a ra uh, Ravenwood, um, a pulp hero called Raven with the Steps of a Mystery, created by Frederick Davis. Uh, and Rick has a copy of that one, too, um, which is incredibly crafty, and that was the one I got to play with the most. And that's my cover. Uh, that, the artist version of a bayek. Um, Raven that, is... That's all Lovecraftian, I mean, openly. Mm. Right. R Ravenwood is an interesting character in that... Uh, He's sort of the forerunner of Marvel Comics' Doctor Strange. Could you go into that a little bit? Frank? Definitely a delay. Yeah, uh, he's a forerunner to Doctor Strange is what I think Rick was going with. Um, Doctor Strange, uh, you know, the, the white guy who goes to Tibet and learns unusual magic from an Asian ancient is exactly what that story is. Ravenwood was the son of a uh, diplomat who learned magic uh, after his parents were killed by a car by an ancient um, Asian uh, monk known as the Nameless One. Uh, in that one, um, I took a very famous, uh, well, some people use him as the hero, actually, a Nazi Superman known as Sun Ko. Uh, that some people actually write as a protagonist, a friend of Rick's and mine actually do this. And as a person who doesn't want anything Nazi to be positive, I decided to make him the biggest stooge of the Lovecraftian creatures possible. Where this character, Sun Ko, is like a Doc Savage. He's a giant, he's beautiful, he's super strong, he's super genius, and uh, he ends up, he, he wants to bring back the uh, old, the outer gods, the old ones. Uh, to the uh, uh, to Earth while using the Nazis and I had a lot of fun playing with that because there's no more fun in life for me than making a Nazi look still. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sun Ko does you know, just in case anybody didn't get it was a German pulp hero. So a, they, the Nazis even had pulp heroes. Until, surprisingly, the Nazis were the ones who shut the character down. Right. They thought it wasn't, good enough. It, was, it wasn't good enough for their ways of doing things. The Nazis were, in some ways, much less interesting than, than what fiction makes them. You know, they were very uh, sterile in some ways, and that's kind of horrible to read about. Well, it wasn't good enough about that character to them. So there wasn't any Captain Germany? Um, not that I know of, because they really thought of things like that as um, uh, as a waste of time. 
You see, as much as we would love to think of of Hitler and all those characters as these overtly occult crazies, the ones that were that really actually believed that stuff, that did that stuff, were a very small percentage of the SS. And even they, most of the people that worked with them thought they were idiots. I mean, they really, there's a lot of writing where, you know, most people would roll their eyes at the, when these guys like Rosenberg and all of that would come about talking about their ancient race theories. Most of them were just really, you know, Nazis were mostly just gangsters that happened to be in a political position. It was much less interesting. So I prefer personally the pulp, the pulp version of it where they're, you know, interested in all that kind of stuff. You know, it's more fun. <laughs> Speaking of Nazis trying to get uh, secrets of the great old ones, you wrote a, another son of the Jim Wade uh, short novel called The Horror from the Horror, the Horror of Hyperborea. Right. Hmm. It, that was that was pure fun. Hyperborea. It, um, I used the not really the uh, the um, Howard version of it more than anything else. I wanted to have a lot of fun with it, so I used like a combination of several versions of it, and it's a very, very uh, mythos-based story where Thunder Jim ends up fighting against a, a um, Nazi Superman uh, whose father is a very legendary villain in all fiction at this point. Uh, did I just say it, uh, Rick? Yeah, you can say it. Yeah, it's Baron Frankenstein. Uh, Baron Frankenstein, the evil version, not the Cly uh, the Colin Clyde version, but the twisted, evil, nasty version uh, who is using the Nazis as for his own crazy ideas. So, so, it was a lot of fun. So, sort of the Peter Cushing version from the first two movies, more or less. Yes, very much so. Peter Cushing, uh, you know, that twisted... You know, I'm right, even if I'm really not right. Kind of attitude was just so much fun to write. You know, there, there's so much, you can always have fun. A, a good story, me, the the hero almost is secondary to the to the villain being really interesting. I mean, uh, another Pulp Fiction hero that a lot of people talk about is the Black Bat, who came out at exactly the same time as Batman. And they actually had a big lawsuit, and they just realized they had some. Uh, they just had the same idea. They even stole the uh, wings that go on his wrist, his bracelet, you know, his arm. That came from the Black Bat. Bob Kane didn't hesitate to steal it. Really? And that's the first time I've ever heard this. That's, a, that's extremely interesting. Also, the yeah. Black Bat had the same origin as Two-Face. Exactly the same one, which is double hmm. funny if you think about it. They didn't hesitate to steal from him. Here's the thing, the difference between the Black Bat and Batman. The Black Bat's villains were dull. They were just like ordinary gangsters. There was no color to them. If you're going to have a gangster, they have to be that three-color, four-color version. I mean, Dick Tracy is still around and still known to the world because his villains were so excellent, even though he was such a straight-laced character. Mm -hmm. And that was always my view. You have to make the villain so much more interesting. Uh, otherwise, it's just not going to be worth reading. Uh, you know, you're right. That's a, that's a huge reason why Batman became so popular. You're right. Just, just to give... You know, we don't want to spend a lot on the Black Bat, but just so people know who we're talking about. His name, ironically, was Tony Quinn, Anthony Quinn. That's just a coincidence. <laughs> he was a district attorney who gets acid thrown in his face, but instead of this messing up the flesh as in Two-Face, it blinds him. And then he gets an operation that allows him to see in the dark. So he's sort of a forerunner of uh, Daredevil from Marvel to some degree. Hmm. Now, Don't be surprised if he was stolen directly from there because the pulp characters were direct influences on all the early comic characters. I mean... Superman's Fortress of Solitude, well, that's where Doc Savage used to have his secret uh, hideout in the North Pole. You know, things like that. The pulp was very honestly and openly stolen by the early Marvel and DC comics. And, you know, they didn't fight it, so why should we? Well, and uh, DC is a lot cooler than Marvel, as Joe Pobre will probably tell you. Right, right Joe? 
Oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. even even when you go back pre-Marvel into Timely and whatnot, which is the pulp era, you, mm -hmm. you can see everybody, we'll say, borrowing from everything. Um, you know, yeah. hey, steal what's cool. We do it today. Uh, Frank, um, I'm always interested in the different answers I get to this question. What is it uh, about Lovecraftian themes uh, that appeal to you? Why do you work that into into some of your stories? Or what what appeals to you about that? Well, what appeals to me about the Lovecraftian themes is the alienness of the enemy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy to write about a human evil. We see it every day in the news. But when you deal with a Lovecraftian monster of some kind, you're dealing with an evil that is on such a higher level than anything you could deal with in humanity. You know, it's the thing that I, I actually have some issues with is some people try to almost create like an almost heroic version of these days of Lovecraftian monsters and I rebel against that because one of the reasons I loved Lovecraftian mythos was this was a problem that unites humanity if you really come down to it. It's where all of us are the victims here. It doesn't matter what your country is, what your skin tone, what you believe in, you're food. You're, you're nothing to these creatures. And that even the sight of them will mess you up, that you need to... It, it, it's something that we all need to work together towards. And that, to me, was just an awesome theme. And, of course, Lovecraft really believed there was no law, no way to win these things. But I didn't mind that because I could, that gave me a chance to dream my own direction as, uh, through my whole life. I honestly never believed I would get a chance to be here writing these stories, you know, being talked about, being read by other people. So to me, the the theme of that overwhelming horror, that alien power that is beyond us all, that you almost has to unite us to survive. It's a great theme. It's a great, fun theme for me to work with. That's a great answer. Um, well, speaking of that, how long how long have you been writing? How long have you been, been published? Uh, I've been only published about eight or nine years, really, right now. I got started um, through the same place I met Rick, through Tales of Shadow Men. Uh, Peter, uh, we're all like, uh, Rick and I are all shadow men, and I got a chance to write for J.M. Uh, Lofsier, a great man, who pretty much started me out. And one of the great things about it was that he also was the one who said to me, "You know what? Get used to being edited because you got you got a lot to learn." He's a very honest guy, and so I got really a great start there for him. And um, as such, I'm a lucky person. I really say that all the time. I'm a very lucky guy. Getting getting back to uh, whether you can win against Lovecraft entities or not, I've always felt there were two uh, views in the Cthulhu mythos. There was Lovecraft, who says, you know, we're, we're doomed ultimately and we can just delay it, and not totally optimistic, but at least more optimistic, was a Robert E. Howard view that we can fight back and and at least die on our feet. And I think yeah. you subscribe more to the Howardian view than the Lovecraftian view. Am I you correct? I've always been more of that way, too. Joe, were you going to say something? Yeah, I mean, Laird, me, on occasion, you know, go down swinging. Maybe, maybe you can sneak through this one. If not, you know, go down swinging. It's it's yeah. not uncommon as we look at, you know, various Lovecraftian fiction here and there. I mean, it's not prevalent, but it's been out there. As Lumley, opposed to what? If we, if, we, if, we, if we go back to some of Lumley's yarns, you know, um, uh, what is it, Spawn of the Winds? Yeah. And in the moon of the moons of Boria. Well, yeah. In, in a lot of Henry Cutner's work itself. Right. Another good point. 
in, in a way, Henry Cutler's The Invaders is very much a Durlethian type story, in that you can call up other entities to banish the evil mythos entities. Whether yeah. they're rivals or good guys is not clear in Cutler. Yeah, and we've talked about, uh, and we had him on the show too, uh, F. Paul Wilson's Repairman Jack series where the the two entities, the, they aren't good and evil, they're they're evil and just want to win the earth is the other guy. He doesn't really care about humanity. No. And there's Richard Kearney. What's that? That's Richard Kearney's mythos too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're those who want to... Uh, have a large expansion of humanity so they can kill them off and they die in terror and they get a psychic feast. And then there are the others who oppose that because they don't want their enemies to get a food source. <laughs> That's how the humans work into it. Uh, Charles Strauss is actually hitting that these days too. Um, his uh, laundry series talks about how uh, he calls it Case Nightmare Green. The day that the, that the invasion begins and he says one of the reasons is simply because there are just too many humans. Uh, it, it's a food source, and he's very he gets into a very almost bureaucratic way of dealing with it. That's very interesting because I work in civil service to see how a civil service mind deals with all crafty creatures. Someone asked me one time what I thought uh, just to to really summarize what. Lovecraft was all about, and my answer was, I thought about that for a second, I thought, okay, probably you, you can summarize it to four words, there is no hope. <laughs> so, <laughs> you just can't win. Well, there's, back lately the, there has been people who believe otherwise, but I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> back in the 80s, I, I've seen these around when there's the Campus Crusade for Cthulhu was popular. Uh, I saw one of those brochures about when this guy is undergoing a... Um, like a Christian conversion, except he wasn't, and it was like the guy was teaching him the chant to summon Cthulhu and says, and if you do this, you'll be eaten last. <laughs> that's like, <Yeah>. that's, that's <laughs> going to be your reward. You'll be eaten last. Oh, I remember seeing the same thing, except the reward was to be eaten first. Oh. <laughs> well, whichever. Well, <laughs> we advantages should either way. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Uh, Frank, for those who have not uh, yet read you, where would you recommend that, that reader start? Or, or does um, it matter? Um, it depends on what you're looking for. If you want more of the Lovecraftian stuff, I would start with maybe Ravenwood, because there's a very there's a big Lovecraftian series in there. Um, mm -hmm. Thunder Dream Raid Volumes 1 and 2, uh, and... Um, Probably the first seas, which just came out a few months ago. Those would be the the areas I would start out with me if you're going for a more Lovecraftian thing. So Ravenwood, and what was the second one's volumes one and two of what again? Thunder Jim Wade. The New Adventures of Thunder Jim Wade. Thunder Jim Wade, that's right. And then the one that came out recently, that's a collection, isn't it? Uh, the first yeah. seas. First seas and other tales. First seas and other tales. Okay. Yeah, again, that's a great cover. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Pick that up, guys. I, I kind of viewed First Seeds as your uh, attempt to create various series heroes. In a sense, I guess. You know, honestly, whether any of them ever get written again, is it's not up to me anyway. But I wanted to just have fun trying things. You know, sometimes you just gotta, you just can't write for for other people. You just gotta sit down and write for yourself, and that's a lot of those stories were, including one of them, uh, I actually wrote for a contest. It's a, um, it's almost an urban fantasy story, but it was fun to write. Uh, I can throw one more Lovecraftian thing at you guys. Uh, to mm -hmm. Think about it. Yeah, I don't know if any of you have ever read Larry Correa's um, Monster Hunters Incorporated series. Uh, Lot of Lovecraft in there, lot of guns. Lot of guns. Larry loves his guns. But he's always been real nice to me. I've asked him a couple of questions on guns for pulp writing. And his idea is honestly that if you have enough guns, you probably can win. That's his view, I think, of, of how to do it with the Lovecraft. Uh, if you have enough guns and enough bombs, we can win this one. Uh, 
I'm not sure I agree with Larry, but he's CJ, huh? telling me. Yeah, CJ was really big on that. CJ was such a nice guy. That, that's a CJ Henderson take on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, CJ was a great guy, and I love talking to him about that stuff. Uh, his Teddy London stories very much were like that. Uh, getting back to, you mentioned writing this stuff for fun. Trent uh, Zelazny was telling me that about his dad, uh, Roger Zelazny, when he wrote uh, Night in the Lonesome October. And as he when he was writing it, he told Trent that uh, I haven't had this much fun writing something in years. And uh, yeah, that that's a big, that's a key. Pardon me. That comes out in that book. That book it really comes out that mm -hmm. Mr. Zelensky was having a good time because I was having I must have been having a ball re reading it because I must have read that 15 times when it came out. Just the idea of a story that where you can get all your universal horror characters in one spot, the Lovecraftian theme. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that man was always good, but boy, he was on. Yeah, and Jack the Ripper yeah. is a is a good guy. <laughs> that was that was a tough one for me to swallow, but I enjoyed it. I'm a former uh, criminal historian. I spent a lot of time on the on the Ripper stories, but he proved it could be done. He did good. Mm -hmm. You're also an expert in martial arts. I, that is true. That is my thing. I am a second degree black belt in mixed martial arts, and I pretty much do it every single day. I've uh, been doing it for about 14 years now, and I just we just actually had a black belt test, and my wife passed for her black belt, so I'm married to a black belt as well. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, there's a lot of martial arts usage in my stories because I'm able to show different fighting styles and everybody, including just somebody who doesn't know how to fight. I really do understand the idea there, and I'm able to be a little detailed on it. Um, I hope it works and doesn't bore people, though. You, yeah, that's, you, that's a good point. Yeah, I can see how that would help. Sorry, Rick, go ahead. Saying you were telling me um, that when you watch movies, you can tell what uh, martial art they're doing based on their fighting style. There's a lot true. of times. That's true, Rick. Uh, the problem with me is when you get it's it's with everybody, honestly. When you know the inside of something. Uh, you know that people don't that people find a little mystical, whether it be police work or CSI work or martial arts. It becomes very mundane to you, and you actually start watching it from the point of view of um, of is that a real move? Is that a real move? Where would that be from? Where is those stances from in martial arts? I was watching a, a spaghetti western martial art movie today called uh, Shanghai Joe. It's a really dopey movie. And I actually was seeing it was much more Japanese-based martial arts, even though they were saying he was from China. And it's like that didn't make any sense to me at some time. For uh, Mike, I just have a question. In the, I guess you've seen all the Christopher Nolan uh, Batman movies. What what fighting style does Batman use? <laughs> Good question. In, in those movies, Batman's style is very much based in um, a theatrical version of Mist Martial Arts. His movements are more Japanese style um, than anything else. His stances are very high. If you, you see the way he stands, he doesn't stand very low. And he keeps his hands and elbows kind of close to his body. His kicks are not very high and flashy, which would suggest something like uh, one of my teacher styles uh, he mastered is called Kyoshin Kai, very tough system created by a man named Oyama, uh, and where it, where the shots are meant to satsu, death in one punch. That's what that's the basis really of what he does there. But he mixes it up because he uses some aikido in his throws. Um, no real grappling shown there because grappling isn't very visual for most people. Last time I saw grappling in a movie was the first Sherlock Holmes movie with Robert Downey Jr. where he and Watson had the giant guy, Frenchman, and he actually used a real grappling move to disable the man, um, a, an arm bar that's very dangerous. Right? Uh, but on the whole, I would say more of a Japanese MMA style. Uh, it was where Batman came from. That, that 
Legends. Yeah, Rick's right. I'm a huge Batman fan, and that that would have been a great trilogy if it hadn't been for the the last movie. You know, it's just I don't I it was awful. Well, I didn't think it was awful. I just thought ridiculous. I, I've always had an issue with the whole broken back thing in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a comic, but uh, you know, and uh, what the heck was going on with Ben's voice? <laughs> so you know, yeah. that just kept me out of the film. Um, I did like yeah. the way they had been fighting. His fighting system is very realistic. Um, if it was similar in a style to me, where you sort of occasionally will take a punch, and you get it. Uh, but it, it, he didn't look right. I, I expect Bane to be you know, almost professional wrestler style. Yeah, yeah. I have a question for Joe. What style is Captain America using the Marvel movie? Huh? Well, I mean, to fr let Frank answer. Well, uh, Captain America's style is a theatrical version of Wuxi, which is Chinese. It involves a lot of jumping, a lot of uh, moving around, um, quick, fast movement, uh, flash kicks. You know, a lot of backflips and stuff like that. You can see versions of that in the um, Shaw Brothers films, the versions of that. It's a more realistic basis, but that is where it really came from, in my opinion. Um, it, and I enjoy it. You know, I can get myself out of it. Yeah. Well, plus he's got super strength, you know, which... How much, uh, how much does he need to use martial arts, you, you know, you'd think? But well, Captain America, uh, I mean. you, know, uh, you know, I guess you're right, but he can help him from the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say that he's going to have more problems when he fights the Black Panther, who has his skill level and some more acrobatic style of fighting. In um, one of the recent comics, Black Panther of World War II took on Captain America and beat the heck out of him. So it was kind of fun to watch that. Yeah, and DC Comics, I don't know so much recently, but, well, yeah, in the 90s, you would say this is accurate too, but uh, Batman taught Superman a lot of uh, martial arts moves, just, you know, for the occasions that Superman came up against somebody at his strength level or, or near it, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, that was always fun for me to see. Yeah, they... Um from what I gather, and I've left the comic world pretty basically, except for my friends like Jay Piscopo and people like that. No, uh, Batman, apparently, uh, Batman now, now apparently is the master of like 232 versions of martial arts, which, you know, my teacher has been doing it for 43 years, and he's a master of about seven. And he's a yeah. former United States champion and professional bodyguard. So 232, and the guy's like, what, 28, 29, or something like that? 30, they're getting a little demented. You know, I'd like to see how they can talk about it. But you know, it's a comic. Yeah. Rick, you got any more questions for Frank? Yeah, um, just... I have one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, go, Matt. Go, Matt. Uh, this is only sort of vaguely related, but since you like the pulp stuff and you like the martial arts, if you're going to recommend us a movie where the martial arts are, say, the best spectacle that we could see that's kind of accurate, what would it be? Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. For all these years. Of all these years, he was, the, he was 50 years ahead of the world when he did that. The opening sequence of that movie, he's fighting Sam O'Hung, the great Kung Fu star in later years after him. He starts out traditional... Kung Fu changes to more of an American kickboxing style and uses a grappling move known as a crucifix to beat him in the end. It is a perfect spectacle demonstrating pure martial arts in one location. I would always say Enter the Dragon first and foremost on everything. It's, it's the forerunner of everything that came afterwards. Hmm. Rick? Yeah, I have just one. Since, since you, Pete, and I all write for Tales of the Shadowman, which is a uh, 
crossover type anthology written in, in the style of Philip Jose Vaughn. We've all tied the Cthulhu mythos into something which you wouldn't in a million years think have any connection to the mythos. What is the most obscure thing you've linked to the Cthulhu mythos in a story? And then as Pete, and then I'll give my answer as well. Uh, for me, it's probably in the story that's coming. Uh, I have a story coming up in uh, in this where I actually created the origin of Simon King of the Witches. Uh, you know, that you cannot get more obscure than that. Um, I combined Dennis Wheatley, who I love, Simon King of the Witches, um, a French demoness known as Mephisto, and Rosemary's baby in one spot in an almost Lovecraftian story. It has kind of hidden Lovecraftian tales. And I'm more interested in how people that like Simon King of the Witches, which is like a will take as soon as I actually explain where it comes from. <laughs> How about you, Pete? What's the most obscure thing you've done? Well, um, there's that scene in the, well, it's like the whole chapter on Reanimators where Charlie Chan wanders into Dr. Howard's office and says, My wife is pregnant. Help me out here. But, um, and then Charlie Chan ends up dying and being brought back. Um, that's probably the most bizarre thing I've ever done um, in terms of crossover fiction. The um, the piece that's coming up uh, in December in Tales of the Shadow Man Eleven is a is a um, Robert Peasley uh, story uh, set in Clark uh, Ashton Smith, a, a Lord man, with. Uh, a reference to um, the Colossus of Florida. Now, when you say the most bizarre thing you've ever done, you are referring to your fiction, right? Yeah, and not fiction. And fiction. not stealing yeah. cars and not stealing out cars, them. having sex with fish. No, we're not talking about that. Sex with fish. You actually just said sex with fish. Yeah, you know there is a burgeoning fish porn market. Yeah, that, 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 leave it. Keep it. To yourself. Yeah, well, yeah, to you yourself. Tap into that, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, so what's your answer, Rick? Uh, I used, I wrote a story for Tales of the Shadowman, which I think was in number five, called All Predators Great and Small, where I was tying in mythos elements into vampire fiction and movies. And I used some obscure vampire called Count Frankenhausen from two Mexican horror movies of the 1960s. Probably nobody reading that knew who this guy was. All right, well, uh, Rick, do you have any more questions for Frank? No, Are I'm done. Torturing him. Matt, anyone else got any questions for Frank? No, but thank you for coming on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, uh, so again, yeah, thank you, Frank. And again, to the audience, uh, yeah, I'm mostly a Lovecraftian audience, you know, weird fiction, Lovecraftian. Um, if you're interested in Frank's work, uh, like you said a few minutes ago, he just came out with uh, his collection. Uh, remind me again, the uh, C's one? What was that? First, first season of the C's. First, first C's and other tales. Yeah, let me put you on the screen, Rick. There you go. And then, um, what were the other two? My memory. Um, the, the Lovecraftian ones would be Raven with the Stepson of Mystery. Raven with the Stepson of Mystery. Trying to think of. Right. Yeah. And uh, two volumes of uh, The Adventures of Thunder and Wade. Here are the covers for Thunder and Wade. Okay. They're all on Kindle, right? Yeah, I'm not sure about Raven. Yeah, Raven would make it. Yeah, I see the the collection is on 
on Kindle. I'm going to grab that later today. So oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Oh, Hope you enjoy it. I'm sure uh, there's a few people watching. They're saying the same thing. It, that's an awesome cover. So I um, really like that with that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thanks for being on the show, Frank. Uh, we're going to keep talking, everybody. I wanted to talk about Ursula Le Guin. I never am sure if I'm saying your name right, and a few other things. Uh, Frank, you're welcome to stay or go, whatever you want to do. So I'm going to stay. I love this. All right, great. Um, so uh, I'm going to let Joe talk about, start off talking about this. She, um, what were those awards yesterday? Um, Book Award something. I can't think of the name of those. The National Book Award. National yeah. Book Award. Yeah, so there's a video of her <laughs> accepting her award, and she, she talks about some interesting things. Joe, you want to talk about that? Oh, go ahead. Set it up. I, I posted what? the link on the web page. I love the speech. I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful speech. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll quote it a little bit, and then you can talk about it, yeah, Joe. Sure. Uh, I think hard times are coming when we will be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now and can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being and even imagine some real grounds for hope. Um, we will need writers who can remember freedom, poets, visionaries, the realists of a larger reality. Um, yeah, that what a great line, the realist of a larger reality. Oh. Yeah, she touched on Amazon too. Mm. I don't have the quote well, on I that. Mean, here here here's here's somebody saying, you know, all all fiction is relevant. You know, um, which is a good thing. Um, opening that door Kicking kick kick on that door so that the forms of literature that we work in, you know, all the various genres or stripes that fall under that umbrella of the fantastic, they're all viable. It's only a question of talent. It's not a question of, I, I mean, you can have brilliant pulp fiction. You can have brilliant, whatever kind of fiction you want. Um, it's just a question of the, what's the quality of the work itself. Um, and it's, it's good for the soul. It, it really is variety. I mean, you know, you, you want to eat just one thing. I mean, in a perfect world, if, if, if everybody could, you know, some days you eat a steak, some days you eat a pizza. How, mm -hmm. how many people would drive a different car every day or, you know, a, a Corvette this week and a truck next week, if, if they could, just, just, just to do something different. Um, uh, and visionary... All great, great literature, that's one of the most important aspects of it. Whether it's Moby Dick, whether it's To Kill a Mockingbird, whether it's um, Lovecraft. There, that's, you know, um, Lovecraft is a visionary. Uh, he's finally... accepted mm -hmm. as, as an author of letters. Um, we need more of these writers accepted for the quality of the literature, for their vision. And, and we have a host in the past, and as we look around now, we have a host of them who are working now. Uh, Chief among them would be, let's say, Kiernan and Barron. These these are great visionaries. They're incredibly talented writers. Um, to to pigeonhole them or to shackle them because 
someone thinks they're genre writers is that that's an affront to literature. Yeah, she said some. She said, "I'm going to read another quote, and you guys talk about this." And then Christopher Golden said something on Facebook earlier today too. I want to talk about after we talk about this. So if you guys will help me remember. But anyway, as to what you were saying just now, here's the here's her quote. We need writers who know the difference between the production of a commodity and the practice of an art. Um, and then in the article, it uh, says she emphasized the importance of uncoupling art and profit and hinted less than subtly that Amazon and other industry juggernauts are guilty of this crime to the detriment of literature. You know, I want to talk about her her point and then I want to get more specific as it as it pertains to say Amazon. So I mean, you guys want to comment okay. on on that? Yeah, now I do. So there's actually the great social critic show, The Simpsons, and they had an episode where Neil Gaiman was the um, guest, and Lisa Simpson had this author who she liked. It turns out the author was a committee, so. <laughs> They formed their own committee to write a new, like, Hunger Games kind of novel for young people. Right. And Neil Gaiman ended up stealing the idea, you, you know, so they didn't get anything out of it. But it was really, I think, pretty acute. I bet this happened where the company said, this is what's selling. Let's get some people together and knock this together with the kind of characters that – these uh, consumers will identify with so they'll just buy without thinking. Right, and let's go over it mercilessly and say, okay, that works, that doesn't work. Not to the point of, not to the point of uh, it's good or it's bad or it's good writing or bad writing or good characterization, but to the point of, uh, okay, that'll sell better than that. You know, that'll sell better than that. So. <laughs> Matt, can you check well, your there, sound? There, there, there. We were talking, it was flipping back and forth between you and Mike. Uh, I'll yeah. turn it off. And I'll mute. Well, what was it doing? Commodifying. It was flipping back between him and you. Oh, okay. It was like an echo. Okay, go ahead, Joe. Commodifying art is dangerous, limiting. Uh, I mean, as a writer, you know, we can't afford to do this for free. Um, but, you know, we want to be read, we want to be paid. Um, you know, because, let's face it, you know, they, they want us to pay the phone bill and the power bill, and uh, if we Um, but, but this commodity a horrible thing. We, we, we commodify, when we start commodifying, we put blinders on and we force this stuff into some little tunnel or funnel. And that's when we start to limit the process. And, and once we place limits on it artistically, that then it suffers. And the first, the first person who takes the body shot is the reader. You know, once you once you limit it, where's the next Moby Dick? Where's the next Lovecraft? Um, or you know, pick pick your favorite writer. Um, where's the next layer? Where's the next Kiernan? When when the marketplace is is so heavily commodified, um, all, all those past eras where the majors would take a new writer and manage that writer and work with that writer and allow that writer to build a readership. Um, if, if 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 we commodify too heavily, then that which is that that's shrunken over the decades, that would disappear altogether. Um, what is she trying to say more specifically when it comes to Amazon? Um, 
Well, Amazon's just the monster. Amazon's Walmart. Yeah. It's, it's forcing the marketplace to do what it wants. And it's obvious that Amazon has long-term long -term goals. And, and they want to be the only game in town. Well, the only game on the planet. And, and they're trying to box everybody in. You know, they want to tie both hands behind people's back until you have no option but to agree to what they want you to agree to. And as we do that more and more, then we become more limited. Um, yeah, Amazon is a great tool for buying. It's all there. You can get it quick. It's mm -hmm. cheap. But look what it's done to brick and mortar. Now, we're all old enough where when we were younger, we could go into brick and mortars. And how many things were purchased in brick and mortars that we wouldn't have purchased had we not been in that store? You know, you turn, you see something, you see a cover, you walk over to it, you pick it up, you look at the book, it's in your hand, and you've already decided it's coming home with you. But, 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 it, but it could be accidental that you encounter that. You, you, you wouldn't have had that happen had you not been in the brick and mortar. That's a loss to, to readers. Well, let me let me play devil's advocate, and I I don't disagree. There's been they, they've definitely done some bullying, uh, but talking about from the reader side, what you were just talking about just now, you're right. You've lost that, and I'm not going to disagree with that at all. However, at the same time, I I find myself I've got far more access to books than I used to have. And that's a great thing. You know, for, for that guy who's in one horse door upstate New York and it would be an hour and a half to drive someplace that had anything that remotely looked like a bookstore, that's mm -hmm. a great boom. And to be able to buy the books at discounted prices for the reader, for the customer, is a great boom. But just just like anything else, you know, it's a two-edged sword. Um, so, yes, it's helping it help some people a lot. Um, I, I'm interested in that because Matt's a great reader and buys tons of stuff. How, how often do you continue to go to brick and mortars, Matt? Uh, well, part of the thing is I've lived in several cities through my military career, and um, there was a bookstore in Denver called The Tattered Cover that was five stories. My mm. wife and I didn't have any kids. Friday night, we'd go out to dinner. We'd stop by the bookstore. We'd waste hours there going up and down. And then I lived in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and there's this store called Books and Company where they had a big open section where they'd have people playing chamber music on Sundays and they'd have pastries and you go around and read whatever you want. I have never been in, like in San Antonio, they had nothing like that. Biloxi, Mississippi, forget it. Uh, here in Peoria, no way. You know, I've just recently found the Contemporary Arts Center for little modern music gigs. I am dependent on the internet. Now, the way that I try and circumvent the big boys is I try and go direct to the publisher, like Dark Regions Press or Chaosium, and order from their website uh, and say, well, maybe it's just a few more bucks in their pocket. Or if um, an author is pushing their books, it's my genre, and they're pushing it on Amazon, well, I'll buy it. The, the view is, is like I'm not trying to support the publishing mergers. I just want the authors to have people who uh, read them so they're encouraged to write. Yeah. But I'm limited. I am not, if I lived in Denver, I'd still be going to the pattern. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I'm guilty. when when I mean, I promote a lot of stuff that I like on Facebook, you know, on my page. Um, 
So when when and you, and you made Livia the, the the writer of the week on Lovecraft Easy. So, yeah. so all those times where I've talked about and shared Livia's engines of desire, I always put it on the Amazon page um, because it's 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 quick, it's accessible. Because what I'm interested in is letting the reader have a quick vehicle, an on-ramp, to get their hands on that book. Um, uh, so so I, I'm guilty of assisting in this commodifying in a way. Um, but like I said, I see it as a two-edged sword. You know, books are, books are cheaper. They're readily available. You know, when you want... Weirdo. I mean, we, you guys know the kind of oddities I buy book-wise. So for me to be able to go on and buy A and B and M and Y all in the same place, I mean, when I was in Portland for the film festival, we went to uh, Powell's, and we had a great time there, and I found one essential thing that was on my list, but there were I walked in looking for three. Which I could have bought all three on Amazon, but I, right. I was hoping to come across them in Powell's. I only found one of the three in Powell's. Um, so that's a great thing with Amazon. Is there they are, and oftentimes cheaper than what you could buy them in a brick and mortar. But again, we make Amazon a bigger entity, and I can't help it. For the life of me, I think there is monstrous intentions in the background there. They don't want to... Yeah, I mean, when they first started, yeah, they were a big bookstore. They were cool as hell. Wow, I can get that. This is great. Now they want to sell everything. And they don't want us going anywhere else. Yeah, and I, I don't want to come off as... Um Defending Amazon because there's definitely been some bullying going on, and I, I think you guys are more attuned to it than I am. Uh, but I, I do think, like pretty much what you're saying, Joe, it's it's more of a nuanced response. Um, you know, as it, small press, Amazon helps immensely, um, and there's some. Uh, let's take it a step further. There's some very good. There's a lot of self-published crap out there. You know, maybe 80, 90 percent of self-published is crap, but there's some very good self-published authors out there too. Oh yeah, um, look, self so it's a difficult question. I, I see self-published the same way as I see regularly. Ninety-five percent of it is crap. You know, whether it's music, whether it's books, film. You know, um, there's. But you're right with with, 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 with with literature. There are some really wonderful things being written and self-published. Um, we, we have a lot of writers who parts of their catalog are being returned to them. They've been out of print for years. And these people are now um, putting them in, into e-books and, and, and selling them themselves. Right. Uh, you know, so what, when I complain about ebooks, my, my complaint is that somebody out there who shouldn't be writing, who has no talent and no ability and doesn't even have interesting ideas, has got some series with like 14 ebooks. And these things just clutter the marketplace. Right. I'm, I'm not talking about the good ones, I'm talking about the the sludge. You know, we don't even want to be on the same side as the street as this material. Yeah. But the same thing happens with real published books. If I can jump in. Yeah, go ahead. I got some. Um, this actually didn't really start so much with Amazon. Um, I saw this phenomena started in the early 90s. 
uh, with the publishers the publisher themselves in the young adult market started taking out the original short books that they were doing and publishing more and more series with the idea of multi-phase marketing, you know, trying to get the TV series, the uh, the comic books, all of that. They were they pushed out the regular writers, the the uh, people who were trying to rise up through that market and replaced it with corporate interests like Mike had spoken about earlier. It's it became uh, a market that was flooded and still is to this day with corporate planned series. They find the concept of the moment and they write it with the idea of hiring somebody to do it and throwing them off if they don't need them with uh, with the hope of selling it as a TV series or a web series or uh, anything else that can be bigger. So Amazon really in a way just seized on what the publishers started. They just did it better. They just did it smarter and they started pushing the publishers out too. You know, it really came down to this. To this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, uh, I don't think we can say, all right, never use Amazon. Uh, well, neither can we go. Uh, it's just, it's a very complicated question and a very complicated answer, I think. If, if you want to, you know, one of the, uh, sorry, Pete. If, if you want to put it in some historical context, you know, Amazon is very, very similar to Sears and Roebuck a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. You got the catalog once a year. It was a doorstop. And whatever you needed, it was in that book. And you ordered it, and it came to your door. It took a little longer. The difference now is that catalog is infinite. There is no editing. There's no discretion. If you want to put your product up on Amazon, go right ahead. We're not going to stop you. No quality control. No weeding out of bad suppliers, bad manufacturers. That, that, that is a phenomenally great point, Pete. In the old days with that catalog, you had buyers. Right. We theory were examining the product, and the product was getting vetted. And, and you're right. Nowadays, it's all there. There's no vetting. It takes an act of God to get a product off Amazon. Very hard. With a, or a vendor. It's very hard to get bad vendors and bad products off of Amazon. Uh, and because Amazon really has no, no cash incentive to get rid of these people or these bad yeah. products. Matt, so, you were uh, going to say something earlier too? Well, uh, something that's very interesting that, that um, who Charlie Strauss reviewed in detail all the history of publishing and the ins and outs and why things fell apart and the move away from uh, books that were regionally sold in the supermarkets to Walden books to the fall of uh, things like um, uh, Borders books um, and music and, and kind of why this happened and where the publishing company is going. Since he's an author who this is his living, he's very interested in it and he's also extremely tech savvy. Um, I may try and uh, go on to his blog tomorrow and link his posts on the subject to the web page because they are really quite acute uh, and written as well as only he can write, um, very detailed. So if, if someone is looking for a uh, why did this happen kind of history, I actually found that to be extremely useful. I, I guess if I could summar up, summarize my feelings on this right now, it's that, as I've said a couple times already, they need to stop the bullying. Um, and on the, on the other hand, as a small press entity and as a reader, I've had nothing but a good experience. And, it, you know, if it wasn't for uh, programs like Amazon Associates, you know, the, my, my readers and viewers buying things through my Amazon portal and links and so forth, I'd be in pretty bad shape. It really helps fund the, the magazine. And I'll also say that every single time I've had as a reader 
um, and as a small press guy, but especially as a reader, I've had an issue or something's gone wrong at Amazon, and it's rare on that end of things for me at least. This is I can only describe my experience. They they've gotten right on it. They've been polite. They they took care of the problem. It, it, it was it was really good customer service. At the same time, I can see the bullying that they've done to uh, some publishing companies. You know, so so anyway, it's definitely worth talking about. Um, and I don't think there's an easy answer. Uh, last thing I want to talk about there is real quick. There is, there is um, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. I, I concur with you. I, I don't think that there is an easy answer. Um, yeah. You know. Last thing I wanted to talk about real quick was, and then I'm going to give this away to a random viewer. Um, by the way, um, everybody, if you haven't picked this up yet, make sure you do it. It's awesome. <laughs> Are you reading it now? I just embarrassed Pete. I've got it out so I can start reading it. <laughs> and, of I, course, be sure and pick this up, please. Um, you'll be glad you did. It's got really great reviews. This is yeah, that's a good book. Love from Craft Easy and Press. Thank you. Scott Thomas, he's awesome. Uh, and, uh, as always, Joe Pulver books, Rick Lay books. You know, uh, to go to these guys' Amazon pages on this panel, um, all you got to do is is go to their website. In Joe's case, go to joepulver.com. It'll take you to his to his site. Um, oh, you got the Namatas. Yeah, yeah Which outstanding. One? Uh, Nicro Namicon. Yeah, I'll bet it is. Yeah, I mean, I haven't there, read uh, he'd be an yeah. yeah, we had him on once before. What's the title? I can see it's Nick Mantis. By the way, Mike, I, 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 I put... Uh, the link to Charlie Strauss's blogs about publishing on the web page. They are okay. all extremely well written and well worth perusing, especially if you're an author. The guy can write like nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nick's book is called The Necronomicon. Okay. Uh huh. In and it collects his Lovecraftian stories. Oh, it does. Okay. Uh, yeah. So check that out. Uh, for everybody that's watching, you're interested in, in these guys' work, uh, you can go to joepulver.com, which will take you to directly to his Amazon page, uh, and try to scroll down to his books, and that will help him out a lot. Um, ricklay.com, L-A-I, and PeteRollick.com does the same thing. Uh, Christopher Golden, last thing I want to talk about real quick was Christopher Golden posted on his Facebook page that he said something to the effect of um, he's... Most of the authors that he's met, you know, uh, writer heroes, uh, they've been really nice, and one one of them, one or so, wasn't, and it kind of soured him on reading that writer's fiction from that point out. In other words, he met the guy, and the guy was a jackass to him, and so, you know, his question was, is it just me that this happens to, you know, when I... When the writer's a jerk, you know, I'm, it, it kind of sours me on his writing. Or do other people feel this way too? You know, will, my personal response was, I probably shouldn't feel that way. I probably should separate the art from the artist. But yeah, it is hard to me the few times that that's happened. So, what do you guys think? I, I got a story for this. Okay. So, back in 1980, I, I'm not going to name names or the product, but back in '86, I became a big fan of a. A, a small press comic that I really enjoyed. It was almost self-published, and it took about eight years to get all the issues out, and it became a best-selling movie, and it just had a huge amount of merchandising associated with it. Absolutely loved it, bought everything this guy did. Went up to the World Horror Con in Atlanta and brought a whole bunch of stuff to get this guy signed, and... Um, he didn't show up to his signing. Mm. And uh, his promoter gave me a, a, took my phone number and called me when he was out there, which was about six hours later. And um, guy's a cokehead. <laughs> and you could tell he's twitching through the whole thing. So that's from that point on, is it hard for you to 
read I sold, or watch I anything? Sold everything. What? Oh, I did sold, you? Okay. I sold it all. I he just was nothing I wanted to be associated with anymore. Hmm. What about now, the rest of you guys? Uh, okay, here's this has just happened to me recently. I I friend all the authors in this genre that I can, mainly to just try and keep tabs. You know, not to communicate with them so much, but keep tabs on their work. What are they publishing? Because it might me give me an avenue to a new edition or something. You know, I love doing that. Right. There's an author I friended, and almost 90% of what he publishes is like right-wing uh, political stuff, which I just kind of ignore. And you know, everyone's got their politics. He posted My publishing a link. You mean on his Facebook page? On his Facebook page. Okay. He posted a link to the news feed of the ISIS video where they shot all the Syrian soldiers in the head and then machine gunned the bodies. This is very graphic, actual murders on the news feed. And I think, you know, what about the families of those murder victims? Do they want to see their loved ones getting shot? And what is the point he's trying to make, that we're going to spend blood and treasure to stop this horror in Syria that we can't? Okay, it's like, so I protested to Facebook that this was inappropriate content for the news feed because it was too violent. Because my kids go on my webpage, you know, and they said it does not violate our policy on violence. Excuse I'd rather see someone, if, let me be blunt, I'd rather see someone sucking a dick than getting shot in the head. Okay, you know, you know, the you know thing is, is, I'd rather see porn than murder. This was yeah. real murder. So I unfriended the guy, and uh, he's not written anything major, but he's written a few Lovecraftian pieces. Mm -hmm. And I am—I don't know if I'm going to get anything else of his. Because, and I even wrote him a note saying, because of this video, I'm unfriending you. You know, I know right. that doesn't mean anything, but it was just the point was, do they think this is right to? post something so horrible just because uh, they want to shock people that the current uh, president isn't doing all he can. Right. Joe, what were you going to say? Um, there is a, pic a painting. I don't know. It's 100 years old, 150 years old. It's, it's a bunch of witches riding broomsticks against the night sky. They're, they're all naked. You can see breasts, you can see nipples, etc., etc., etc. I love the painting, and, and I've forgotten who's done it. If, if, I, if I could throw it up here quick, everybody would go, oh, yeah, I've seen that. Um, but Halloween, I couldn't put that up because there's breasts and nipples. It's a work of art. But somebody can put up what Matt just described. Now, I know that there's been... Good point. A, a half a dozen of these headings, you know, and I've heard them semi-described on the news. Um, I've been told that they're easy to find on the net. I wouldn't look at that. That's, you know, it, it's one thing to watch an old horror movie. It's another thing to see a human being actually murdered. Um, no way. I, I can't believe that that would be allowed. Not on... Yeah. You know, well, uh, you know, Joe, Americans, especially, it seems... And we all violence have... Violence is okay, but uh, a breast is not. You know, I don't, I don't get it. But this well, isn't pretend is violence. Like Matt said, his, his kids... No, I, I know, yeah. He, Matt, Matt's, Matt's got young sons. Um... You know, his kids come in and out of the room. Pete has daughters. We we have spouses. You know, uh, there there are things that we don't need to see or shouldn't see. Uh, so you know, when I mean, I I write on occasion quite graphically about violence, violence. Uh, you know. So, Joe, how do you feel, as to my question, if a, if an author, whether on Facebook, like Matt just gave his example, or you meet them in person and they're just an absolute jerk, does that, personally, does that sour you on 
the next time they have a book come out, do, do you feel like, oh, I just... It, it, it very well can, because I'm one of those, you know, if, if, if you're not a nice person, I don't want to bother with you. And if 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 you're an ass bag, last thing I want to do is put money in your pocket. <laughs> Good point. Uh, there's there's a million books out there I'm not going to get to read that I want to read. So even if you're good, you know, I'll just skip over to another book. There's dozens and dozens I don't have that I want. You know, um, uh. And there's nothing wrong if that happens. Um, now, in defense of, I've been to a whole lot of conventions, and um, people come up, and you spend the amount of time with them that you can. Maybe you're busy. Maybe you're en route to somewhere. You know, maybe you got a panel you're supposed to be on in ten minutes, and you're not sure where the uh, Rooms, room is yet. Um, right, and, and you have to brush off someone and say, "No, I got to go." You know, I, I w in in two thousand and seven, I think it was in Saratoga at World Fantasy. Willem and I were standing in the hallway, and Ellen Datlow breezed by, and and Willem grabbed her, and she was very nice. Hi, blah blah blah. You know, and and within, you know almost immediately after the introductions said you guys really have to excuse me I'd love to ch be able to chat but I have five minutes to find this room that I'm on this panel right of course there's there's a lady who's busier than you know a rat at a garbage convention um, right. well and, and we all have sense to me. I wouldn't hold that against her no and, and we all have days where we get a little crabby or yeah it, you know, or, you know, I remember a couple of conventions ago, and it's great, but people kept coming up to me, and, oh, you're the Lovecraft e zine guy, and, and it, it really is great, but I was really in a lot of pain, as per usual. I was getting really tired, and I just had to escape. Molly showed me where the, the green room was and got me out of there, but it can happen. But, you know, I, I'm more talking about someone who's just an absolute jerk and doesn't need to be, you know? Um, does that sour you? And I, I, it does for me. I mean, Rick and well, Rick, what, you know, the other thing too, though, is, is, is I, I, I think most people are, are are discerning enough that 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 they can figure out was it somebody yeah. who was busy or is it somebody who's just an asshole? Yeah. You know. Um, uh, and and at least in our community, and and. You know, everybody from Brian Lumley to Ramsey Campbell, you know, over the years, everybody for the most part has been really nice and really friendly. You know, I, I mean, I can remember 95, 96 at one of the early Necronomicons, and there was a Ramsey Campbell, and it wasn't a proper signing. It was a reading and then a get-together afterward. And a guy came up with a hand truck, and he introduced them with boxes of books. And he introduced himself to Ramsey Campbell, and he swore that he was not a dealer. And there weren't two volumes of anything in the books. They were just all Ramsey Campbell books. Mm -hmm. And... And there was this little grin and expression like, oh, my God, I'm now, my arm's going to fall off Stein and those. Yeah. But he said, tell, as he was, as, as the books were being signed, you, you could tell the guy wasn't a dealer. I mean, he yeah. was just like... All these books that he treasured were being signed by the author. Um, I, I think you can tell who we are when you meet us. Um, yeah. And most of us aren't shy. Um, most of us will spend time with nice folk. Um, of course, it goes both ways. If you're the asshole 
we don't have time for that because we get to convention all kinds of demands are made on our time plus we want to get to spend time with our friends and yeah. and our fellow writers who we don't get to see often um, um, Rick does that sour you if you meet a an author that's a jerk does that sour you in the future reading their stuff and, and Frank it probably would, but it hasn't happened to me yet. I've been lucky enough to meet only wonderful people. Yeah. Well, yeah. Having... Go ahead. Sorry, Pete. I'm done. Oh. <laughs> who, who, who's this one guy? Card or somebody? This, this, you know, virulent homophobe. Oh, who's got card? Oh, is, oh, is that, is, is that the guy? Yeah. I haven't read the guy, and I know a lot of people <laughs> like his stuff and whatnot. I, I'm not going to bother. Right. right. I, you know, if I mean, that's exactly the point I was going to make. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Frank. Um. Well, my I've never had any problems with people. I've always had experience meeting people, but. Uh, when I read about something somebody says or does that is so outrageous, Orson Scott Card, perfect example. Um, there were there have been others along his lines, um, and I'm not even being political. On the whole, I, I, I pay very little attention. Don't discuss politics with people. It's my somebody is right. either violently racist or homophobic or something like that. that um, well, I, I, Orson Scott Card's the perfect example. I had a game when I when I read it originally, and I had a copy of it always. And I couldn't bring myself to burn them or throw them out like dramatic fashion, but I gave them all to the library saying, you know, something. Is Frank fading out for anybody but me? Yeah, he's, he's fading out. I think um, Orson Scott Card like turned on his control dial and zapped him. <laughs> you know his past and the times that. He... I, I mean, let's face it. We, we, yeah, we, go ahead, Joe. We're, we're we're all human beings. We're 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 emotional as well as intellectual. We have our likes and dislikes, and. Maybe maybe we do a good job controlling them, but you can't always turn them on or turn them off. And if to some people they're what the what the I'm a writer. If I say that I'm predominantly a liberal, what well, there might be conservative people out there who go oh, forget it. I don't want to read that kind of guy. And that's very true. They're entitled. You know, it's it's like I don't do religion, I don't do politics in general. I you know, it's that I talk about amongst my friends, not on social media. Social media, you know what, I'm going to go to the mall and say, "Oh, I don't like this and I'm for that and I'm against that." I don't do that. Social media is a public forum. Um so whatever, I don't think there's any right or wrong here. If if you don't want to read someone because of who they are, not their writing, but because of who they are as as a human being, or as an inhuman or unhuman, that's fine. Um, and yeah, I think uh, uh, I, this came to my mind again, not just with Christopher Golden's question, but. Uh, you know, well, Bill Cosby's not a writer, he's an actor, but the, the recent Bill Cosby thing, you know, I, I see newspaper articles talking about people throwing out their their Cosby show DVDs. And I, and I wonder, you know, what is the right reaction? Is there a right reaction? You know, I, hell if I know. I, I actually witnessed um, one that happened in a very public forum um, mm -hmm. at a, a Tropicon in Boca Raton, uh, the guest of honor was James Hogan, 
who, uh, in the middle of the, the banquet dinner, went on a 10-minute rant on Holocaust denial. Mm. Mm. Given that, you know, Adam Troy Castro and Mike Resnick were in the audience, lots of words were said. And, he was, uh, uh, you were saying he was denying the Holocaust, that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. And the convention literally collapsed. <laughs> I bet. Uh, Nobody wanted to be on a panel with this guy the next day. Nobody wanted to buy books. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly not the forum for that. No, it's not. The, you the know? issue with Bill Cosby is, is what you have right now are allegations. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Right. Yeah. It's like that gets into it's like one thing to witness something like Pete did. It's another to have these allegations, and then you – we desperately don't want them to be true. Maybe they are true, which would be just a tragedy, mm -hmm. but shouldn't we better reserve it till there is some kind of uh, – yeah, you're absolutely right, and I was I, I should have been a little bit more I should have said something to the effect of assuming it's true. Um, you know, but but you already have some people throwing out their Cosby DVDs, you know. I just you know it's sometimes it it's hard to separate the art from the artist and I, I question sometimes if I should even even try. There's one writer in our particular pond, our genre that they're a real jerk to everybody, and while I think they're a very talented writer, I, I can't pick up another one of their books because of it. So that's my reaction. Maybe somebody else's reaction would be different. Yeah, okay, well, let, here, let's, 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 let's say time can heal some of these wounds. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I will listen to uh, Siegfried's Rhine Journey. Gorgeous, lovely orchestral textures, wonderful use of the winds. No one could write like Wagner. And he is a vile anti-Semite. You right. know, in Israel, they won't let anyone play the music of Richard Strauss, <coughs> who was like the music minister for the Reich. And he is the one who wrote also Sprach Zarathustra, which is that wonderful um, Pythagorean chord progression that starts off 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah, you know, Matt, that's an excellent point, that there's, there is a huge difference between someone who had an attitude or, or did something, say, 200 years ago, and someone you ran across in a convention yesterday and they kicked you in the balls or whatever, metaphorically. So, so okay. yeah, that's a good Can point. Can talk about Nick Mamatas again? He wrote an essay recently, it was linked to on his page, where why should people write Lovecraftian fiction today? And right. he spends the first two-thirds of the essay explaining why he was such a bad guy and why his racism was bad and stuff. And then he goes to these contortions to say that, you know, but why should we worry about it? He's 80 years dead. <laughs> it's like, dude, I don't think that hard about it. You know, I enjoy it. I, en no, I don't embrace well. his racism parts, uh, but I enjoy what I enjoy, and I'm not, and it's like, obviously you do too because I got a whole book that says you do, Right. I don't yeah, know. I don't know no, what the right uh, answer is. What, comes to Lovecraft. I don't, I don't know. Was he racist? Yeah. Okay. Um. I'm done. Let's move on. But, but on this whole subject, I don't know that there is a right answer. No. I, I think the only right answer is for the individual to make up their own mind. If if you want to look around and see what other people think, okay, that's fine. But still. Hopefully. Yes, but I'll tell you one thing. Here, here, here is the wrong answer. You're, you're right. There is no right answer. And, but here's the wrong answer: telling other people how they should feel. Oh know. yeah, no, no. You, 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 you don't have that right. That's okay, right. let's face. I, I'm not religious. You're entitled yeah, you don't to practice. Hell, I know. You're entitled to practice whatever religion you want, and. You know, I hope it does well for you. I hope I hope it gives you great benefit. Mm -hmm. But don't don't shackle me with it, and don't abuse anybody else with it. Those are rights that your religion does not give you. Um, 
So again, you know, everything is individual when when we're here. Um, you know, writers. I know writers who are good friends of mine who are very conservative, and I'm virtually, you know, ninety nine point nine 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 nine. We disagree. Mm -hmm. um, still decent people. Yeah. Um, just because we don't agree on this and that, we agree on other things. You know, we like. So, uh, quite a bit of the same stuff, or or we wouldn't be friends. Um, I, it's, I once I I have patients who come into my clinic who are diametrically do not believe the way that I believe, and I still treat them all the same. Although uh, the ones who are overtly racist say overtly racist things to me, or very massage. I. I Call them on it and say, "I don't think that's right." Or you know, well, that's when the needle goes in and hurts extra. <laughs> right. You know, well, it's like everyone gets treated the same, but it's like, it's like I'm not going to like sit someone let that let someone sit there and use racist remarks. You, right. you know what I mean? In front of me, why should I have to put myself through that? Yeah, right. you shouldn't. It's your office. Throw them out on their ear. I well, just advise that maybe we shouldn't talk about that in this setting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, we're, we're in theory we're all in, intelligent. Make, you know, do your own evaluation. Make your own decision. Yep. Yeah. You know, well, I thought it was an interesting question that Christopher Golden posed, and I, I thought it would be interesting to talk about it. So thanks, guys. Um, for everybody watching, uh, I want to give away a co print copy of Lovecraft Easing. Um, doesn't have to be this particular one, um, but if you would like to be in on that that drawing, uh, email me now at lovecrafteasine at gmail dot com. Lovecraft e z i n e at gmail dot com, and please put in the subject um, magazine contest. We'll go with that, and I will use random dot org to pick somebody. Uh, in five or ten minutes after the show is over, and I'll I'll email that person, and I'll I'll put their name on the message board as well. So, and, and so, there is I, something I like to touch on. Yeah, please go ahead, Joe. When we were talking about Amazon and commodifying and whatnot, and mm -hmm. and Matt Matt's excellent at this, and he always brings it up, and needs to be commended for it because Matt does. Matt will. When he wants the new strands of his book, he'll go to Hippocampus and buy it, you know, right. which supports the press and Simon. Um, for, for everybody, when you come across a press that is issuing material, books that you enjoy, when you become a fan of Willem Pugmire or Pete Rollick, I don't know why you'd become a fan of Pete Rollick, but <laughs> if you've had a few too many drinks, you know, and you think he needs a new fishing pole or something, you know, or, or Laird Barron, it doesn't matter. But let's look at Kiernan for a second. You know, it, it, Kiernan will say it's tax time and the royalty checks haven't come in. And right. she's selling old copies of her books on Amazon and whatnot to, to generate money. Writers, we, there, we can always use a review. I know somebody who's in the process of reviewing a book of mine that's four years old. And they say, well, I'm sorry, I should have before and I just thought about it. I, that's fine. You love the book and you're writing a review, which you're going to post. Reviews help. Sharing posts. If you see something that looks interesting, you know, um, you know, Pete's got a new book coming in April. Wow, that looks pretty cool. Share it. Um, we we could all use the help. The old business models where writers, authors were nurtured and carried along until they developed their a, a large enough readership. They don't exist anymore. For the for the most part, we do our own promotion. 
whether we do it well or not. And the other thing is, is there's no goddamn handbook on how much is too much. Um, and we all sweat about it. I, I have seen more than one writer, like, you know, or received a message. It's like, you think that looked like spam? No, I don't. But somewhere out there, somebody did. Um, we, yeah, we it's, a, it's, a big, it's, it's a hard balance. Yeah, but we really and truly could use your help. So if, if, if you are enjoying what we're doing, please, uh, uh, a review. And there's so many places, from Amazon to Goodreads to whatever. Um, you could look down and go, oh, well, you know, there's 27 four-star reviews on Goodreads. Mine, does, my, mine wouldn't add to it or anything. Sure it would, because the 28th positive is, is valid. The number goes up. Um, uh, so just as readers, you, you can play a very large, especially nowadays, you can play a very large role in what is going on in, in the sales of books. Just by raising your hand and saying, yeah, that one's good. Um, yeah. And if you didn't like it and you want to write a bad review, you're entitled to that too, with one caveat. Don't be vicious. I don't, there's, there's, there's no need to be nasty. We're all human beings. We're all on multiple social media things. There are plenty of trolls. There are plenty. There's way too much nastiness. Um, it, it's it's easy to write a review where no, I didn't enjoy this one without being nasty about it. Um, that, that's all I wanted to chime in. You know. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Joe. I mean, yeah. There's a there's a lot that readers can do to to help the authors that they enjoy and you enjoy an author's work. Doing those things will help ensure that. You get another book from them, so. Yeah, and and I mean, like I said, whether it's Laird Barron, whether it's Caitlin Kiernan, whether it's Willem Pugmire, whether it's me, whether it's fifty more people I can rattle off of the top of your head, um, your support helps us more than you know. Um, uh, so. I see people are emailing me with the contest. Thanks, sir. I appreciate everybody watching. And guys, thanks for being on the panel. Um, Frank, thanks for being here. And anytime thank you want to come back, much. you're certainly welcome to. So. Thanks, guys. Thanks, oh, guys. Thank you very much. We'll you guys have a good week. Talk thank to you soon. Later. Thanks for watching, everyone.